Hello everyone. Today I want to um, look at a game between Arcade United with the White Pieces who was rated 2685 at the time of this game versus one of our top 10 players and one of my favorite players uh, Fabiano Caruana with the White Pieces and he was rated 2662 at the time. This is from a few years ago in the European uh, 17th European Championship and this game took place October 28th 2009 again Nidic with the white pieces and Caruana with the black pieces so let's see how this game went the game started off e4 e5 knight of 3 knight c6 bishop b5 Roy Lopez a6 Bishop takes c6 and this is uh, an unusual guess at uh, top level chess but nevertheless it just does show its head every now and then this is known as uh, the Roy Lopez exchange variation because of the early exchange of the knight on c6 and uh, this is one of the oldest variations of the Roy Lopez and uh, the idea is very primitive and simply to remove the defender of the e5 pawn in this case it's the knight on c6 defending the uh, pawn on e5 so why not remove that defender damage the pawn structure we see these double pawns and capture the pawn right here on e5 Knightage castles. The reason why we don't capture this pawn here is because after knight takes, I'll show you real quick. After knight takes, then simply uh, queen d4 and uh, queen d4. There we go. And you see that the knight is attacked on e5 as well as the pawn on e4. So after knight e3, then uh, queen takes e4 check. Or knight f3, queen takes e4 check. And black is just fine. Therefore, this capture is delayed. Now after castling, the pawn is legitimately threatened. And now there are several ways for black to defend the e pawn one is f6 and all these ways are perfectly playable there's uh, queen to d6 where uh, black usually quickly develops his uh, c8 bishop and plans to castle queenside there's also queen f6 with the uh, uh, same idea except that a little more pressure is added to f3 so in combination with the bishop and queen on f6 black threatens to ruin white's kingside pawn structure there's also uh, moves like knight e7 with the idea of coming to g6 again what happens on knight e7 is if knight takes e5, then queen d4 is playable. Again, because there is no uh, fear of a check down on the e-file with the rook. So queen d4 can be played and uh, say after knight f3 attacking the queen, then just queen takes e4. So there's several ways of defending this pawn. Bishop d6. Now, in this game... Caruana chose the very strong and uh, you know highly recommended Bishop G4. Now, note that this is a uh, can become a gambit. H3, and uh, for instance, if Black goes back, let me just put this on real quick. If Black was to go back say here this is perfectly playable and you, there are a few games like this and after g4 
bishop g6, knight takes e5, where white uh, takes the pawn, and black actually ga uh, gambits this pawn. And what he gets in compensation is um, this weakened king side, king side pawn structure of black. Many times, the mode h5 is played. This queen invades the uh, the dark squares. For example, queen h4, queen f3, uh, f6 is playable. Castle queen side, bishop d6, with the mean attack coming from black on the king side. And I believe he has full compensation, by the way. So, h3, and in this game, h5, and this is what is usually played. The idea is that on the immediate capture, h takes g4, h takes g4, note that the h file is open. And with the pressure from this pawn on g4 on this knight, the knight is compelled to move from the defense of the important dark squares, g5 and h4 respectively. And then the queen comes over. So for example, knight h2, then you can see queen h4 simply uh, wins the game. So that is the idea, the main idea. Because there are several ideas, but that is the, the main tactical idea behind the move. Bishop to g4 and then h5. Is that here, this pawn cannot really be, uh, excuse me, the bishop cannot really be captured. Without uh, paying uh, the price of black becoming better in the position. So instead of knight h2. Say just d3 leaving the piece there. Then simply g takes f3. Queen takes f3. Again queen h4 with continued harassment. The only move is now for white to give up a pawn. After queen h3 queen takes h3. G takes h3 and rook takes h3. And this is not what white signed up for when he played this opening. So, you cannot take that piece right away. So, d3 is often played. Now, black's additional idea, along with getting this piece out, is to develop this queen, usually to f6, adding more pressure, and, uh, excuse me, adding more pressure to this knight on f3 and threatening to ruin white's pawn structure. And after queen f6, further idea, notice queen f6 guards this pawn also, is again to castle on the queen side and orchestrate an attack to uh, white's king, who has slightly weakened his king side somewhat by playing the move h3. Queen f6 by Caruana. And knight bd2 is usually played. Sometimes uh, bishop e3 is played also just allowing allowing the simplification. And this move has been played by Grandmaster Igor Gleck right off the top of my head. So it is playable but knight bd2 keeping the pawn structure intact is the normal continuation. Caruana plays knight e7. Note that a straight up g5 can be played here. This, this is a dangerous system. If you play the exchange variation, you definitely should know it. So 97. Again, the, the bishop cannot really be taken for the same, uh, the same reasons. So he would have to play rook e1. And just basically give back the piece. Because this, this is not going to work. For the same reasons. Queen h4, queen h6. Okay. So, Caruana is just not uh, hanging a piece. 
All right, so 97 is played. <clears throat> and normally, after 97, the idea is to go to G6 and enjoy this outpost. And notice that in um, most of the King Pawn games, one of the uh, main ideas for white and black is to get to these outposts. For black, it would be F4. And for white, it would be the F5 square. And you'll see that in many openings. And that's the idea here. 97 to go to G6. Knight H plays Knight C4. Now, the downside of Knight C4, or what I perceive to be the downside is, is he allows black to damage the damage uh, his pawn structure. Basically, equalizes the game. It's like black is... Um, has damaged pawn structure on the queen side and white on the king side. So, Nidich is basically bailing out here, allowing an equal game, and basically saying, okay, let's just play and see who uh, who's the better man here. So, normally what's played is rook e1, continuing, and I'll show you, uh, I'll show you that continuation because I'm going to show you another game in this line after this uh, video. So knight c4 was played. And we see there's uh, an attack on the e-pawn. Basically the idea is uh, to basically provoke black into capturing an f3. And this is what Caruana does. Bishop takes f3, queen takes f3, queen takes f3, g takes f3. And have no doubts about it. The game is absolutely equal right now. But white has a slight push in that the e-pawn is attacked. However, knight g6, this is where black wants to go anyway. And so he neutralizes that quickly. Rook d1. And of course, play that move eventually. Mobilizing these pawns. Bishop d6. I do want to take this time to, uh, before I forget about it, is to say that um, one of one of the trumps that Black has in the position after the move, um, Bishop takes c6 by White, uh, and exchanging his bishops is he has the bishop pair, uh, and that is an asset for black in compensation for his ruined pawn structure and i would say that is probably the only thing that i don't like about the bishop g4 line for black is that he gives white you know he allows he gives white back the bishop here and usually uh it's in exchange for for nothing and to me that's one of black's trumps and uh he usually will give wind up giving up the bishop here in that line for some some kind of pseudo activity that usually peters out and like i said we're going to look at another game where where the white side is played a little more accurately because here you might be looking at the position and say well i see nothing wrong with blacks a uh, white's position or black's position rather and here again it's totally equal king f1 is played And one of the ideas behind King F1 is this pawn is is little uh, kind of awkwardly placed, and it'd be hard to defend it after, say, Knight H4. It will be it will be uh, kind of difficult to defend here. Okay, uh, let's interrupt it for a second there. So after bishop d6 is played, king f1. Now I did is say, for instance, after a move like that, then the king can ease up to e2 here. c5. This shuts down the 
idea d4 for the moment a4 and now black uh, is going to find a little uh, pressure on this queen side exhibited by white white wants to play these types of moves a4 a5 and um, put pressure on these weakened pawns in the position black decides to play a5 the only downside as we see is this square right here and in order to guard this square with the c6 he has to pay the price of weakening the b6 square and note also that the bishop is being anchored by c6 so basically the position is equal but white is probing probing and trying to provoke small weaknesses in the position c3 and we all know or should know the purpose of c3 usually that is to support the advanced d4 especially in king pawn openings and we see the same reasoning here king e7 bringing the king toward the center bishop e3 again just probing the weakness notice the superiority of white's bishop here on e3 over this defensively placed bishop rook hd8 and now knight h makes a surprising uh, decision here again this is a position that's relatively equal and he has the slightest of advantages but if you want to say because i think that white's pawn structure is just slightly um a bit more sound so what nidich decides to do here after i spoke about this defense this defense ridden bishop is he trades off this good piece for that bishop and straightens out white's pawn structure to boot but he has a plan and the lesson from that is if you do give up an advantage you make sure you transfer it for another advantage and we're going to see what happens in a second so d4 is played and black doesn't really want to capture because um, all the captures would kind of lead to a worse pawn structure for him here so it, it keeps the tension b6 is played and we see these pawns are potentially targets and we have some weaknesses around the light squares and now we see also another feature in the position is white is the only possessor of the bishop rook a3 where's that rook going right here rook wants to play b3 targeting the b6 pawn f6 now i just want to say that the position again is pretty equal black should hold this with no problem however we're not computers and or engines or we shouldn't be anyway and uh, the game has to be played so there are some structural deficiencies here we see all these pawns except one for black all on dark squares which is great for um, uh, white's dark square bishop if he could somehow get around uh, get through that pawn chain eventually he can attack all those pawns down the road so this is a strategic plus for white other strategic plus for white is the fact that his rook is aggressively placed on b3 so that pawn is backward cannot be advanced on b6 it must be protected by one of the rooks this places one of the black rooks in a passive position and that is not good but is it enough to say white is winning right now of course not but this is how you build the position is one small brick at a time so after rook b3 rook a b8 rook b5 and this increases the pressure on the entire a5 b6 and c5 complex and now there's tactics introduced 
here for instance with um you know moves d like d takes c5 and for instance pawn takes and then rook takes and some in some instances the bishop will be able to capture and this rook will be in a vulnerable state so that he cannot capture back like that so those are just little things, little storm clouds on the horizon. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. So black's under a little pressure. Seems that he could just hold with no problem. Caruana plays a nice positional move. F8, excuse me, knight F8. I did simply to jump into E6, put in more pressure here. And look in eyeing this F4 square. Right now, white has a strong move here that gives him an advantage. Can you see what it is? If you want, you could just pause the video right now, take a look at the position. Now, right here, the proper move is just simply rook uh, d to c8, it's passive but holding after knight f8. Arcady Knightage found a great move. D takes E5. Can you see why this is a strong move? Let's go back and look at the features of the position. One feature of the position is that this rook on B8 is facing this rook here. Therefore, in an imaginary world, if we were able to remove this rook off the board, then you can see right that black that white would be able to take on c5 twice see it in your head so for instance d takes c5 b takes c5 can't happen because of the rook on b8 will be captured and after d takes c5 if d takes c5 then bishop takes c5 is possible again because after b takes c5 the rook on b8 would be lost Right? But of course, the rook is there in reality. But anyway, that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. You always keep little ideas, features like that in the back of your mind. The other thing, notice the king and the rook are lined up on dark squares. So, again, in the imaginary world, if I could put this bishop right here, I could win the exchange. And it's those two features in the position which allow Arcady Knightage to come up with the combination. So again, going back, if Rook D C eight is played, then the game could go D takes C five, D takes C five, and say B four. And this is just my own analysis. And white as a slight advantage. Again, notice the position of the rook, and this makes a5 possible. This pawn will fall, and white will win this pawn. So I still give white a slight advantage there. But in the game, at the knight of fate, d takes e5 was played. Now, can you see the problem? D takes E5 is played. Why? Because if F takes E5, now, remember what we just looked at? Winning the exchange. Bishop G5 check. That's brutal. So, after D takes E5, Rook takes D8. Now, if Rook takes D8, then the B6 pawn drops. King D, King takes D8. Now we had that scenario that we uh, fantasized about earlier. The rook is now unprotected on the back, and so is this knight. This allows Bishop takes C5. This is attacked, and this can't really be captured because the rook on B8. So just like that, one move, game is over. So king c7, 
killing two birds with one stone basically this move protects the knight on f8 as well it's preserved the pawn on b6 however he's lost the pawn already bishop drops back and notice how white just stays focused at a distance on the b6 pawn keeping uh, the rook tied to the defense Many um, weaker players might have played, you know, bishop takes f8, something like that, which is playable. But I like how he just keeps the pressure there. 96. And Garawana realizes his plan, but unfortunately it was tactically unsound. b4. So... Now, unlike many Roy Lopez exchange variations, White has a queen side majority. And the reason why he has a queen side majority is because Black has unceremoniously dropped the pawn. So now he's just simply going to take his three to two pawn majority on that side of the board and create a pass pawn. So A takes, C takes, and we see now it's a two to one majority. G5. Now this is um, a faulty plan, but may have been born out of desperation. The idea is to play knight f4 and attack this pawn right here, the h3 pawn. Um, so black contains white's crippled pawns on the queen side, excuse me, on the king side with the g5. So that's like the idea is to keep these pawns immobilized, try to come in here with the attack here the, I, the problem is is that white isn't really concerned with what's going on on the king side at this point he's basically just trying to create a pass pawn on the queen side rook d5 so what is uh what's going on here is simply he's just taking over dominating the board he uh centralizes um the rook and you know takes over the only truly open file right now other moves could have been played like king e2 or king e1 centralizing the queen but this move is as good as uh, any at this point knight f4 and this move just simplifies things for white as he just snaps off the knight and bring the king in the center Rook a8 and attacking the a4 pawn and that's easily parried by advancing the pawn a takes b takes and rook takes a5 now notice we had a three to two majority two to one and now you have a one to zero majority and that my friends is how you create a passed pawn and now that passed pawn demands attention from black so rook b8 is played and um it's a good thing too to notice uh b takes a5 as possible he could have took you know he noticed he took with the rook um a lot of times the uh, h the h and uh a pawns can be very drawish in in the end games hard to uh you know certain positions where um it's hard to make a queen there so he avoids that by um playing with the like offering to exchange the rooks because if he takes with the a pawn and leaves the, the rook on um the rooks on the board then there's a lot of pressure that black can apply to that pawn so he takes with the rook he wants to exchange rooks rook b8 and now rook a6 which uh, he's saying, hey, I'll give up the B pawn and I'm going to destroy the king side pawns. Um, so black has too much weaknesses and his position uh, begins to collapse. So basically that B pawn is a decoy and now the rook is going to clean up on the other side of the board. Rook takes F6. Rook B1. Why rook b1? It's just to prevent white from going to the king side uh, via f1 and g2. So from going like this, 
and basically getting out of checks and stuff like that. Rookie six, just attacks an uh, unprotected pawn on e5. Rook b5. So notice how Caruana wanted to stop Nidic from bringing his king back this way. But after rook e6, he's forced to defend the pawn here. And now, da da, king f1. So he gets in. King d7 attacks the rook. Right, but it drives him to where he wants to go anyway, which is rook h6. There's no defense. King e7. You know, the king is racing over, trying to defend basically what is left of the king's side. And also free the black rook on b5 from the defense of the e pawn. So after rook takes h5, this king f6. So now this rook can can uh, attack or try to anyway. Try to hold the position. King g2. And basically now white is able to use his king to support this pawn's advance. Rook b8. The idea is to check the king with uh, g8. So, how does uh, White deal with this problem? Is he plays h4. Now, if uh, Rook g8 check, the king has a square to uh, tuck himself away. And, and this is what happens. Rook g8 check, king h3, Rook g1, and Black, of course, is trying to restrict the uh, White King's movements, but Knight is, has a good move here. Actually, he has a couple of good moves, but he plays rook h6. He could also play rook f5, rook h7, but rook h6 check is real natural to me. And what he does is he drives the king back to the, to the seventh rank in order to create uh, two things, more space and advance the h pawn. King f7. Why is Black, why is Caruana playing uh, King F7? Well, he wants to stay near the E6 pawn in case the Rook attacks it. Right? However, this is like a waiting move, Rook A6. And now, the idea is to use the H pawn as a decoy. Now, check, check this out. So, Rook F1. So the black king doesn't want to move off that f file because he wants to be able to protect e5 uh, as soon as it's attacked. So he kind of wants to hover around here. So the king has two jobs, the, the black king. One job is to guard, sorry about that. One is to guard the e5 pawn in case it's attacked by the white rook. The other is to keep an eye on the H pawn's advance. What does this mean? It means that the king has two jobs and the king is a strong piece but not that strong. So the king is overworked. And this is the reason why Caruana gives up this blockade with the rook on the G file and tries to start to counterattack. So rook F1 and simply king g2. Now kicks the rook out to b1. And uh, and again now the rook has to help with the defense. Because the king is the black king is not going to be able to uh, stop the h pawn. And protect the e5 pawn. h5. Pass pawns must be pushed. And now the plan is in full effect. The h pawn is Nothing but a decoy to lure the black king away from the defense of the ENF pawns. Rook b3. And this move again is, is simply trying to keep the white king tied to the defense of the of the F3 pawns. F3 pawn, excuse me. <clears throat> so simply just keep pushing the, the H pawn. Now rook c3. Just a waiting move. You know, what else What else are you going to do? There's h7. And now, 
something has to be done, right? King G7. So now the king finally commits, right? And guess what happens? Attack the E5 pawn. And that's it. Caruana resigned. So you see that how that plan worked out. That was a beautiful thing. I just want to show you if um, instead of moving the king, if uh, say for instance, rook c8, right? Uh, rook c8, the game could go like this. Uh, rook a7 check. And uh, let's say king g6. King h3. You know, this pawn is just just a killer here. Uh, trying to think of some more, some different kind of moves. Uh, let's see, king f6. King g4. Let's see, king g6. Attack the pawn on e5. Um, and let's say he tries to, uh, you know, make that move. Then there's a real strong move here, right? That's just a killer right there. You cannot capture this because this pawn will queen with check. And then, uh, let's say a move like that. And the king just keeps coming up the board. And uh, I don't know, let's say Rook E8. I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head right now. Rook G, oops, not that, sorry. <laughs> Rook G7. And the idea is real simple to play that. And there's no stopping it, right? Yeah, Rook H8. And then simply Rook to G8. And of course, the only option is that. And then black is busted. But anyway, before all of that happened, Caruana had played King G7 anyway. And then after Rook A5 was totally lost. So what we can say is probably um, Rook C8 offered a, more, offered a more stubborn defense, but he was lost uh, nevertheless. So I hope you enjoyed that game thoroughly. Um, like I said, we're going to look at another game in the same line where where white improves uh, on the uh, previous play. Because our conclusion is that uh, Caruana uh, basically fell victim to a tactical blunder where he was he was pretty much equal. You know, instead of playing that move, um, let's go back. Instead of playing that move, uh, I think it was Knight F8. Um, yeah. Knight of Fate. That was that was basically the you know what caused everything to you know that combination right there. So instead of Knight of Fate, just perhaps Rook D C eight. But I had showed that perhaps White could still uh show an advantage. In other words, the position is still um challenging with that uh light square bishop. So this to me this is a good position for white also. I would love to to play play this. So, okay, so that's it for now. We're going to uh, look at a, another game uh in uh in the next video and um please like and subscribe. All right? I'll talk to you guys later. Enjoy your day.